Good morning. It's good to see you guys. Um, just wanted to share with you a few things of what's going on, uh, what I feel like the Lord is saying to me. Um, I feel like he wants us to do a series in the book of Exodus. Exodus is a tremendous book in the Bible, and I really, uh, really do love it. Uh, it has such a story of you know, coming out of Egypt and going into the promised land. It's a whole long story. And as I prayed about it, the Lord said, no, you got to stop, start back a little bit before that. Because for to find out why the children of Israel were in Egypt in the first place, we have to go back to the book of Genesis. So I began to pull it up and, and study it a good bit. And uh, I felt like the Lord wanted me to start with the book of Genesis, talking about Joseph. Now, bef even before Joseph... We hear the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's a tremendous story um, because Jacob is the one that actually wrestled with God and God named him Israel. He said, from now on, you'll be called Israel. So that's where the name Israel comes from as far as the nation. He promised to Abraham that he'd be a father of many nations. He'd be a father of, of, of so many. It would be like the stars of heaven. It'd be like the sands of the beaches. I mean, Abraham had a promise from God that his descendants would go on forever and ever. But it started to come and track through the story of Jacob, which another day we'll go back and study that dialogue because it's such a huge story. And God put a lot of effort for all that to be held in the book of Genesis from Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob. But I felt like right now, because of where we are in time, he really wanted on the focus on the book of, of um, Exodus. But to get to Exodus, because the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, we have to start with uh, how did they get to Egypt in the first place? Because we know that Abraham you know, went out walking, and God said, I'm going to show you where you're supposed to be, and he had to go by faith, and he was, uh, he was a tremendous man. But the guy that it really started with is a guy named Jacob. Now, Jacob... Um, he basically cahooted his brother out of his birthright, and he had to flee for his life. So he ends up in a foreign country and um, ends up falling in love with a, a, a girl. And uh, she, his, his father-in-law betrayed him, and he ends up, after he gets married, he ends up that his father switches out Rachel for Leah. So he has Leah, then he works another uh, seven years for um, Rachel. But in that, he ends up marrying both Leah and Rachel, and then he has two concubines. Each of them had a concubine. Leah had Zephla, and Rachel had Bilhah. So out of these four women, he birthed seven sons. And But his love for Rachel was, uh, was the highest of all. That was, that was his that was his love of his life. So he has two sons out of there. There's Joseph. And Benjamin, but Joseph, um, <laughs> you know, he is, uh, he's the favorite child. I mean, I think it's because of his affection for his wife, Rachel, but Rachel, um, Rachel loved, we don't know a whole lot about Rachel, but, but Jacob loved Joseph and he ends up giving Joseph a coat of many colors. Now, when we, uh, start looking at the story, uh, we can see that in the story that Joseph was 17 years old, and uh, he goes out. His father sends him out and says, look, I want to go check on your brothers. Now, most of these brothers were from Zifla and Bilhah. They weren't from, uh, from Leah. So those brothers are out there keeping, this pres his, keeping the pasture. And that before this time, Jacob had told them of a, a story about how he was out... Um, how he had a dream. He was a dreamer, and he had the first dream, and he was binding sheaves, and he said, my sheaves stood up and upright, and your sheaves gathered around me and bowed down to them. Now, sheave is like a cluster of wheat or something that's actually kind of out in the field, so it stands upright, and it's probably a way that they processed and cured the, uh, the wheat, you know, like Farmers put bales of hay. There, there had to be a procedure, probably, of what they would do to conserve it so that the uh, the uh, the produce or whatever, sheaves of, of, it could have been oats, it could have been barley, it could have been anything, 
that, that it wouldn't rot. It would actually preserve it. So it says that his stood up and his, everybody else is bowed down to his sheaf. Now he's 17 years old. So uh, he goes out and then uh, he has, an, and then he says, and I have another dream. And of course, uh, everybody hated him because his father had already given him a coat of many colors because it says he was the son of his old age. He was, and, the, and the robe of many colors, we've heard about that story. Joseph had wore it, and I'm sure he he really felt the love of his fathers. And um, so, anyway, as time goes on, this contention between you know all these young boys. Um, you know, from four different women, which you know that would have to be a lot of competition and a lot of, of uh, irritation among them because everybody wants to be special, right? I want to be special. You want to be special. And truthfully, we all are. But sometimes some people are more recognized or some people seem to have a different little bit of a favor than others. And Joseph was that guy. So he starts telling them this dream and he tells them a second dream. And he said, behold, the second dream was even worse <laughs> than the first one okay so he's got the 12 the, you know the 11 bowing down to him but then he said the second dream was behold uh he saw the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to him now even jacob or israel rebuked him for this and he, he said what do you mean do you do you mean that even i and your mother and your brothers indeed will come and bow down ourselves to you to the ground before you and his brothers became very jealous I mean, that, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm one of four and, um, you know, there's enough little tension every now and then between us. I mean, there's, there's nothing left like having siblings because I think without them, um, we would not be near as strong or as, uh, diverse or as able to communicate. I mean, it just kind of helps us rub, rub a lot of the rough edges off. Well, I'm sure Jack Joseph, you know, when he has these dreams, he's trying to figure out what in the world's going on. He's feeling something in his heart. Oh, my goodness, God's laid his hand on me. What do I do with it? How do I process this? Who can I talk to? And I'm sure he's trying to struggle with this. But then as he shares this thing, it makes matters even worse. So there's a day that comes about. And his brothers are out tending the sheep. And Jacob pulls him aside and said, I want you to go and check on your guys in the field to see all is well. So when you think about well, it could be several, several different meanings. Are they well? And he meant, are they okay? But then you think about where Joseph actually ends up with well, that well could have a different, different meaning. So he goes out and he's 17 years old. And I'm sure he's got his coat of many colors on. He's going out there and uh, this man found him wandering in the fields. And he said, what are you seeking? Because I mean, I'm sure he's going around, you know, he's out there and he, doesn't know what he's doing, doesn't have a compass, he does no road signs, no maps. I mean, we think, how did he get there? He didn't have GPS. I mean, we become so efficient with GPS and stuff like that. It's very difficult for, for us to understand that our era is a very small fraction of where generations and generations and generations live with. Just for instance, of us having running water, indoor plumbing, or things like that, or a telephone, or, you know, all those things, we think that mankind has lived with these conveniences, and they have not. They have, um, you know, gone out and tended sheep. That was their career. That's what they were doing. They were watching the flocks. And so this guy says, well, I heard, you know, when he asked him, he said, what are you thinking? He said, I'm thinking to find my brothers. So Joseph's asking this guy for some guidance, and he says, I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So he heads out, and he probably said, okay, which way is Dothan? I mean, it wasn't like he said, you just stay on this road until a certain mountain. You know, it was probably a little path. Who knows what it was? So he goes down there, and they see him coming. And, of course, the attitudes begins to rise. So he says, here he comes, the dreamer. Let's kill him. Let's throw him in the pit. And then we can say an animal killed him. Well, to me, I mean, those guys were saying this would be the end of our problem. I mean, this guy just gets on our last nerve. I mean, he's already favored by the father. You know, he probably gets the best portion of, of whatever's put at the table. You got 12 guys. Can you imagine sitting at a table with 12 guys? I mean, I have one brother. And I know that guys eat a lot more and and they come in, they're hungry and they're ready for this. But all of a sudden, you know, Joseph's always getting this favoritism. 
So that that's that that spurs on a jealousy. And um but Reuben, now Reuben, uh he tries to come up with a rescue plan. And he goes, Well, let's not throw him. We don't want to shed blood and throw him in the pit in the wilderness. And so he says, Let's um strip him of his robe and uh they took him away. Uh, and they threw him and took away his father's en endowment. So basically his robe was an honor and they throw him in the pit. Now there was no water in there, but okay, we read the story, but we need to feel it. We need to understand Joseph's in there and then they go out and start having lunch. The guy, there's brothers who are his flesh and blood, throw him in the pit. They want to get rid of him. They can't stand him. They hate him. And they're upstairs, and they up. Well, he's, he's down in a pit. We have no how, idea how big this pit is. And I don't know if you've ever been into something like that, but to get out of a pit would be very hard because there's, there's not like there was a ladder there. There wasn't like there was a rope there. How could he get in there? It could have been a snake in there. It could have been worms. It could have been spiders. It could have been nasty. There's no telling. It could have been the sun was beating down on him really hard, but his brothers are up above the pit talking this over like ha 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 probably laughing saying you know we got rid of this dreamer guy we got rid of this guy that has the coat of many colors now we can go on with our lives but we got to figure out what we're going to tell our dad so they they take his robe and they decided that they would put blood all over it and tell him you know that that you know apparently uh, um a uh, a wild animal must have ate him so they're eating and when they're eating they're they're enjoying their their conquering of their sore in the side and they're saying you know i just really they were kind of celebrating that you know this this rub was gone i mean it was going to be handled now so reuben you know reuben is you know trying to figure out what's going on and i think reuben must have stepped out of the picture because he shows up later because he he says he didn't really know about what happened in one part of the story but as they were talking and laughing a caravan comes showing up now get this and i had never seen it until i started studying this the caravan they were caravan of ishmaelites now who knows what the word ishmael means ishmael and abraham couldn't you know he he married sarah sarah couldn't have child so he goes into his concubine and he has another son, which is Ishmael, which is where we're experiencing very, very, very long generations of trouble from this because you had Israel, but all the rest of the Arab nations usually come from Ishmael. And Ishmael was a wild man. He was untrained. And, and so, but look what God did. So Israel's children are selling their brother, but the Ishmaelites come. He was the elder son of Abraham. And they were bringing gum, balm, myrrh, and they were headed to where? Egypt. Well, the reason we haven't to look at this story is because how the children of Israel get into Egypt in the first place? I mean, how did they end up in Egypt? Because they sold, his brother sold Joseph out of hatred because of his favoritism and sends him into Egypt. So they sold him for 20 shekels of silver. Now think about that. You know, what does that make you think about? What about Jesus when he was sold? They put money, a money value on this person. And so Joseph is shipped into to, to Egypt. He's 17 years old. Now he's, 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 he's trying, he's on process overload. I mean, he's trying to say, oh my goodness, all these dreams, what the heck is going on? What is going on inside of me? Why is there such a there's such a clashing of two things? It's favoritism and hatred at the same time. He's favored by his father, he's hated by his brother. He's smashed, 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 smashed. And he's trying to go, you know, God, what do I do this? I, I understand the dream had to come from you, but how do I develop this? How do I withstand this complete squeeze, this pressure, day after day, the beating, the beating, the 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 struggle of you know, I saw this dream. I know you, you're going to raise me into power, but this is not looking good. This is not the way it's supposed to be. I thought it was supposed to be that I was supposed to have a smooth sailing. I thought that when I arrived at this place, the red carpet was going to be 
rolled out and the bands were going to play and we were going to they were going to say, oh, Joseph is here, Joseph is here. But that's far from what happened. So they, the Ishmaelites, which would be his distant cousins, in a way, kind of, it's really cool that they came into the picture because it would have been his uh, great-granddaddy's son, which would have been, uh, you know, a, a, I don't even know how to say it, it would have been, a, mm, I don't know exactly how to, to trace all that, but anyway, distant relatives that comes along, oh, just happened, so, no, I believe that God had this happen so that Joseph could be put in the exact spot that Joseph needed to be in, because God has a massive plan for each of us. You know, we like to think, oh, I just, you know, my life doesn't count. We don't have anything, nobody watching us. We have no sphere of influence. We have nothing to say. We have nothing of value. But the whole time, day by day by day by day, if we could really look at our story, God has a plan. And even in this difficult situation that we're in right now, God is progressing us and moving us and positioning us because he needs us to be prepared and be strong enough inside to withstand the pressure from the outside that we don't collapse and we can speak forth the word of the Lord and we can stand against the, the, the schemes of the enemy. So what's happening here in this tension of jealousy and all this, this dynamic God is working in each person something that he needs worked in because he is a loving father and he, he really wants us to mature to be like Jesus. And we say, oh, I want to be like, Jesus is great, Jesus is great. Look what Jesus went through. Look at the things that he endured. Look at the things that he experienced that would prepare him to be the king of kings, to be the Lord of lords. Yes, he was God, he was, he, but he lived his life as a man. And he was caught in so many traumas and so many difficult situations. But yet he prevailed in every situation and he heard God's voice. And so we see... You know, in this story, um, he sold, and actually Reuben comes back and uh, and tries to find him, but he's gone. So he's turmoiled. I mean, he's like, you know, what can he do? I'm sure he was going to try to save Joseph and uh, probably find a way to protect him, make him hide him so that he could grow up and become a man and someday be able to come back into the family. But Reuben is also... Um, you know, devastated. And what are they going to tell? What are they going to say whenever they tell Isaac? What are they going to tell, you know, um, not Isaac, Jacob? What are they going to tell when they tell Jacob? They said, so they made the story that animals killed him and the only thing must have survived was this coat. I mean, it wasn't any shoes. It wasn't anything else. It was the, the coat and they covered it with the blood of animals so that it would look like he'd been torn to pieces. And so from that point on, Jacob goes into a massive level of, of grief because it was his favorite son and it was the one he loved. And so he separated and living all these years wanting to know what happened to him. So the Ishmaelites, they got him on their caravan. So they're walking in. And who do you think that they, what did they do with Joseph? Did they keep him? Did they say, hey, you're a distant relative. We're going to help you, whatever. No, they sold him to uh to potiphar and he was an officer of pharaoh matter of fact he was the captain of the guard so <laughs> in a way this 17 year old young man is caught from from this episode of going to check on his brothers his brothers hate him and then he ends up in egypt sold to potiphar who is the captain of the guard a favor. Now, in other words, this guy was a pretty high rank. And, and there's other stories we'll look at later, but I don't really want to get in it at this moment because I don't want to make this video too long. But this is the beginning of the fulfillment of what God had intended for Joseph and for his brothers. You know, we think that our enemy is 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 our enemy and they are, but because of God being able to work all things together for good. You know, he, he can work out things that we have no idea he's working out. We don't, we don't understand the ways of God. Matter of fact, I drew this little tiny diagram here. You know, it's kind of like 
here, you know, Joseph's going along and everything's looking good. He looks like he's going to go up here, but his life starts declining. And then you, you'll see it later that he kind of goes up this path and then it kind of comes down and it's all jiggly. I mean, our lives are kind of like this. We think, okay, we're going smooth sailing, we're going good, and then all of a sudden it drops down again. And then we go up here, and it's going good, and it drops down again. We say, oh, no, God, we want to have a smooth run with our life. I don't know if this is showing up on the camera or not. But anyway, I'm trying to show that, you know, we, we really like comfort, steadiness, predictability, and it's just not going to happen. It just doesn't happen that way. So I thought of another scripture that I'm sure that Joseph, I mean, David wrote this years and years later, but in Joseph's situation, so here he is at Potiphar's house, torn completely away from his family in a foreign country, in a foreign culture. And if you've never lived in another culture, it's a big deal. It really is a big deal. It's not like... You know, I, when I first uh, went to Barbados, you know, uh, the, the leader of the base said, you must live in a foreign country to really be able to understand the, the complications and dynamics of being a missionary. And I'm like, you know, it can't be that much to it. But, oh, it is. When you immerse into another culture, everything's different. Values are different. Food tastes different. Uh, the way they, the things they laugh at, the things they enjoy. Um, their lens of life is so different. So I thought about this, um, you know, and, and we talked about Jonah, but let's let's look at David's story. Uh, one of his psalms, which I am uh, very much a lover of the book of Psalms, one, Psalm 139. And I think if, if Joseph could have had the scripture, I think it would have been tremendous. Because when all, the lights went out that night, he has to go to bed. And he doesn't know if he's going to be abused. He doesn't know if he's going to be adva taken advantage of. He has no idea what his life's coming up. But he knows his life will never be the same. He has to be brokenhearted because his brothers betrayed him. They left him to die. They went home. They, he doesn't even know what his daddy's told. He has no idea of what's going on on the home front. He doesn't feel loved. He feels the rejection. And he's like, what am I going to do with this dream? Am I, I, I mean, he probably had even wondered if he's losing his mind. So I think about him probably when he went to bed that night. If he'd had this psalm, it would have been very helpful. Psalm 139, verse 8. If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. And this is David talking to God. Because David went through great turmoil too. If I make my head and seal, which is hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the earth of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. I, If I say, surely the darkness shall overcome me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. Isn't that big? Even the darkness is not dark to you. In other words, I mean, that's so powerful. Even the darkness is not dark to you. For the night is bright as day, for the darkness is light with you. You formed me, you formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's room. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. So my friends, you know, right now we think, the world's coming to an end. We think uh, there's not going to be any hope. There's nothing good that can happen out of what we're experiencing. But I beg to differ with you. Think about that. I'm going to read that again. Even the darkness is not dark to you. God himself is not afraid right now. He's not sitting in heaven wringing his hands like this and saying, oh, oh, oh. He's not doing that. He's not doing that. He's saying, I am moving forward. I am bringing my kingdom to the earth. I am going to place my sons and daughters in places of high position and places of authority because I want my will done on earth as it is in heaven. So take heart and think about these things and celebrate that you are the favorite child. And God has given you dreams, and because they haven't come to pass, does not negate that they're no longer a dream. Love you guys. Let me hear from you. Blessings. Bye-bye.